Okay, today's scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I have also received, that Christ died for our sins accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jocelyn. Hey, good morning, church. Really good to see you. My name is Matt, uh, one of the pastors here. Uh, man, a lot of good things going on. We're back in 1 Corinthians, so you have been in John the last uh, several weeks. We've also been in a series through 1 Corinthians. We like to keep kind of larger series kind of going. We get the seasonal stuff as we come to Advent or Easter or whatever and, and kind of come back to these larger books. And so we're going to be finishing up 1 Corinthians uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, leading up to Easter. And chapter 15 is a perfect place to be in the lead up to Easter because it's one of the most, it is the most robust treatment that we have anywhere in the Bible on resurrection, which is what we celebrate at Easter. Jesus' resurrection and and the resurrection to come for for all of us. Uh, And so uh, excited to get into this Lent season with you. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, Nathan brought us a reflection on that at the front end. Hope you are going through those uh, those Lent reflections as we go through this week, that you're fasting from some things. We say no to some things, not for like just abstaining itself, but because we want to say yes to Jesus. We want to put him on. And so we take some things, put them off so we can put him on. And, you know, it's because we carry the preparation of our hearts seeking Jesus. We carry that in our bodies. We're physical and spiritual. We'll get more to that. But before we get uh, into it, I pray and we get into the text that Jocelyn just read for us. Uh, A couple other announcements. Uh, First, you remember a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, two exactly, so so a couple. Uh, I came up here and introduced to you Dan and Kat as, well, Dan Ginter as an elder candidate. His wife Kat was with them as well. Uh, and we said that we're going to be having a vote for Dan. So if you're a member of Westside, uh, we need you to join us in this process. We'll be voting on Dan Ginter as a new elder on March 20th. Uh, and today, which we let you know about in all kinds of varieties, all kinds of ways, many ways we possibly could. We have a meet and greet uh, at 12 o'clock, so right after the gathering, we're going to meet downstairs in the commons. This is just, just a time to hear more of their story, uh, to ask any questions to them, to ask questions about the elder process, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it should be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it. So that's today, 12 o'clock. If you uh, are a member and you're just interested, or you're not a member and you just want to check things out, come on down to the commons and meet Dan and Kat. Uh, and then one more announcement. I'm really excited to make this one. I've been holding it for a while. Uh, I don't know how long ago, six, seven, eight months ago, maybe more, uh, I was approached uh, and our elders actually uh, offered uh, Missy and I a sabbatical, which we're very, very excited about. Um, And and, uh, it's, I didn't expect to get a little bit emotional there, but it's okay. We'll move on. I, I I said no to the sabbatical internally for a long, long time because the last thing I feel like doing is stepping back uh, from the ministry work that he has us involved in. There's so much good stuff happening in this church. Like what the Spirit is doing just by his own sovereign will is so exciting The I just want to be in it and a part of all of it. But one of the things we talk about a lot around here is the fact that we don't want to run this place like an organization, like a business. Like, and this is not a place built on uh, the strength of one or two people. And so one of, the, one of the ways we practice that, one of the rhythms that God has given us weekly in Sabbath uh, and, you know, even, even you know, every, every few years in the nation of Israel, they had even, you know, multiple decades worth of this. He, he calls us to these seasons of rest, these seasons of, of stopping our work, of remembering that the work is his and that he is wholly sovereign over it. 
And so uh, as much as I don't want to stop the work for a season, he's calling us to that. I, I was not really that receptive to the idea of sabbatical. My wife was very receptive to this idea, and she's been talking about it for a long, long time. It, you know, we actually have a policy where every seven years our, our, our pastors are, are eligible. I'm coming up, this is 10 years now for me at Westside, uh, and, and uh, so we're very excited about the sabbatical and, uh, and what God's going to do. I feel a very personal call to it now as we really processed it. And so the other thing I want to let you know about is Mark Willerton, uh, our worship minister. He is also coming up on 10 years this year as well. Uh, he, he, is, he is somebody who is such, him and his family, Mark and Shars, are such a gift to this church. They're a gift to all of us. And, and there's a really important reason why both Mark and I are going to be taking sabbatical this coming year. We're going to stagger the starts a little bit um, and move through it. We'll both be back kind of mid-August. Uh, but but th there is this thing about ministry. Like when you've been for 10 years kind of getting up regularly and trying to minister to Jesus' people, uh, you, you're, you're, you're always drawing from that spiritual well of life with God. And that's really good. You can't do ministry unless it's from the overflow of your life with God. But there are seasons that we require uh, to go and fill that tank up again, to go back to the well. And so the, 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 the call, the personal call I know for Mark and, and for myself, uh, and I just feel this so strongly. I'm starting to get just the, feel the Holy Spirit's just like hand so tangibly on the season of sabbatical coming up for us is uh, I just feel his invitation to the secret place. To, to, the, to the quiet place, and I could not, I cannot even begin to express to you how excited uh, I am to, to come back. So, so uh, the one thing, great thing about this church, and by God's grace, we're so well served. We have amazing worship leaders. We've got amazing pastors and ministers. Uh, you know, the, the staff is going to be led well. The elders are led well. The, you're going to be served well. We've got a great preaching team with Cliff and Nathan and Daniel. We also have guest speakers coming in, people who love you and love me and, and want to serve the church, people like Daryl Johnson, uh, Matt Schantz, they're going to be coming in here and serving you. So it's just going to be, I'm expecting to come back and a revival took place while I was gone. That's what I expect. Uh, so, so really excited about this season. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're, we're very excited about it, but want to let you know about it. So uh, it actually begins right after Easter. So this season of Lent, this season of preparation is a season of preparation all kinds of ways. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15. Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit. We love you. We love you. Thank you for your tangible presence with us. Thank you for your sovereign will and work. And, and Holy Spirit, we want to ask that if there is anything in us, spiritual strongholds, anything in our lives that are quenching, resisting, grieving you, would you just take this opportunity as we gather as Jesus people and guests and visitors and people on spiritual journeys, we just, as we gather together like this, Holy Spirit, would you have your way in your people, we pray, we ask. As we come to this text, Lord, and really just a simple gospel presentation, we ask that you would breathe powerfully through the gospel, that we would experience the gospel, that we would taste grace, that lives would be changed, that we would walk out of here free people. Lord, set captives free today. Wherever the enemy, Satan, his demons have footholds in our lives, just cut those things off. Help us to name them. Just cut those strongholds down. And Lord, wherever, wherever there are people who have not yet surrendered to Jesus, Lord, we just ask that you will lead us to him today. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Lent. Really important season, as I said, season of preparation uh, because, a, a, as we say, notice some things to say yes to Jesus. It's really important to understand that the Bible never compartmentalizes us as human beings into separate spiritual and physical categories. You never are separated spiritually that way. You are, you are to be, as, as, a, as a human being created in God's image, you are a unified whole. We are embodied spirits. And what that means is that the, the spiritual realities taking place within us, they are meant to be carried in our bodies. They are meant to be manifested physically. 
This is a really, really important thing to understand about the Christian life. It, it, it has huge implications for what it means to be transformed into the image of Jesus. This is not just a mental exercise. This is not just a spiritual ideology that you are to somehow understand and then try to, you know, regurgitate back. As we've said lots of times before, like Jesus is not going to come back and give you a final exam when he shows up to make sure you know the right things. He is going to come back and he's going to look at you in the face and the question will be, does he know you? Do you know him? And so that, that's a very physical, a, a very real relationship. The physical world that we live in has been cursed by spiritual death, but the hope of every Christian is restoration. That like this is, this is, this is kind of, uh, it's restoration, not just spiritual restoration like that we experience when we first come to Jesus, but the restoration of all things, a new heavens and a new earth. That's, that's our hope. That's what the Bible calls us to. And that's where Paul takes the Corinthians next in this letter. So we've just come through chapters 12, 13, 14. Spiritual gifts in 12 and 14. Love in chapter 13. You remember that series? We've just come through that. If you're, if you're foggy on it, you can go back and catch it all. There's resources there to grab all of that. We've just come through that. And now Paul is probably here responding to a question that Jesus' people in Corinth had asked him. A question about resurrection. And this is so important to Paul that, they un- that the Corinthians understand that physical, bodily resurrection is an integral part of the gospel. It's, it's actually impossible to understand who Jesus is and the hope we have without physical, bodily resurrection. Most people in the ancient Greco-Roman world believe that life ended ended, like, that de- like life ended completely at death, or was followed kind of by some, you know, permanent, shadowy, spiritual existence, but, existence. but the more educated among them uh, thought that the idea of any physicality after death was just ridiculous. To think that we could die, our bodies could be buried, and then one day we again experience physical life, like, in, embodied again was thought to be Ridiculous, and that's not far from where we live today. In fact, even in the church, a lot of Christians even have this idea of heaven as a place that is somewhere up there. It's a spiritual existence that is going to be forever separated from our physical life on earth. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. You didn't get that from the Bible. You got that from a Philadelphia cream cheese commercial, not from the scriptures. What the Bible actually teaches is that our hope, our hope in Jesus, we are to hope in Jesus because his plan is actually heaven coming to earth. Not us, our hope is not that we go to heaven when we die. Our hope is that heaven comes to earth when Jesus returns. Our hope is the restoration of all things. Our hope is a new heavens and new earth. Our hope is glorified bodies no longer tainted by the curse of sin and death any longer. Our hope is a creation, mountains and rivers and oceans and trees and lakes, no longer tainted by the curse of sin and death anymore. Like this is our hope, church. This is the hope the Bible puts in front of us. And at the center of that hope in the restoration of all things is the reality of physical resurrection. So that's what we're talking about. We're going to look all, we're going to look, we're going to talk all about physical resurrection these next six, seven weeks as we lead up to Easter. We're going to talk about what our glorified bodies will be like. We're going to talk about uh, some of how the physical resurrection works. We're going to look forward more than ever to what Jesus has planned for us, what he has gone to prepare for us. He said he's gone to prepare something for us. Revelation pictures the holy city coming out of heaven, like dropping down. The Bible talks about heaven and earth, like earth being restored. And so we want to talk about this. We want to get our eyes squarely fixed on the hope Jesus has for us. And it's so important right now, isn't it? Coming out of a pandemic with global uncertainty, like just like crazy. We need to fix our eyes on the coming kingdom and not be consumed with with these ones. I've got some cheers in the front here. I'm very happy about that. Um, You know, it's good. And so to begin this conversation on resurrection, Paul with the Holy Spirit breathing through him, which is what we believe that all of Scripture is. 
That's why it's our authority. Paul, with the Holy Spirit breathing through him, starts to explain our resurrection, the physical bodily resurrection that we have coming as human beings by looking at Jesus' resurrection. This is always the way the Christian life works. If you want to understand anything about the Christian life, anything about what your call is, anything about what the Holy Spirit has empowered you, filled you, gifted you to do, made you alive to do, anything about our hope, anything about where we're going, we start by looking at Jesus. This is what Paul is doing here. You want to understand our resurrection? Okay, let's look at Jesus' resurrection. And in fact, the physical resurrection of Jesus is so foundational that where Paul begins this chapter is by explaining, showing that there is no gospel without it. Okay, so just simple gospel today to understand the importance of resurrection. So let's look at where Paul begins in verse 1 of chapter 15. I hope you have a Bible with you. He writes, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. First of all, the word gospel simply means good news. It just means good news. It's used as shorthand for the story of God and for the foundation of the Christian life. So if you're wondering what that word means, that's what it means. Good news. It's the foundation of the Christian life, the story of God. The gospel church is not just where we begin when we're baby Christians. It's the thing we need to grow. It's the thing that nourishes us all the way through our life with Jesus. We, can ne- we never graduate. We never move on from the gospel. And we can see that so clearly in verse 1 and 2 because of Paul's use of past, present, and future tense verbs. The gospel you received, past, in which you stand, present, and by which you are being saved, future. The gospel carries us through all of life. But catch this, the gospel is something that every follower of Jesus, according to Paul by the Holy Spirit, the gospel is something we all have to hold on to. Hold fast to, cling to. It means you can never assume the gospel. It means you never get to slip into neutral and think that you've got the gospel. You have to cling to the gospel. You're being saved, he writes, as you hold on to the gospel. And then he adds, unless, of course, you believed in vain. And that freaks a lot of people out. Like, maybe I believed in vain. How, how do I know if I believed in vain? Does this mean I can lose my salvation? What, what if I have believed in vain? How can I know? Well, what this means in the Greek is actually pretty clear. In the English, it's more confused. And the language here implies coming to Jesus hastily. It means coming to Jesus hastily. It means coming to Jesus without ever really applying your mind to the realities of what the gospel is. Like, you know that it's very possible to have a euphoric experience. A lot of people have, you know, a moment of euphoria in a gathering or an event or a conference or at camp or somewhere, and, they, and that's it for them. And like, I've come to Jesus, but they don't actually really even know the gospel. I've worked as a pastor for a while, and I've had lots and lots and lots of years to sit down with people, for example, being baptized. And, and if I ask them, I, always, I, almost, I actually don't even ask this question anymore this way, because I'm way too nice of a person. I feel way too bad. When I sat down with most people and asked them, hey, what is the gospel? I almost never get the gospel. I mean, I, and I understand it's maybe it's a, it feels like a high-pressure moment or something like that, so minds go blank. I totally get that. And I, but often it's like even with coaching people who've been Christians for a long time, coaching them through this, they, they still can't come up with the gospel. Like, imagine I just pulled ten people. I'm looking at you right now. I can see you. Imagine I just asked you to come up on stage right now and share the gospel with us. W- where would you begin What would the middle consist of? What would you end with? How would you explain the gospel in a way that, you know, does what the Bible gives us as the gospel justice? And so when he says, unless you believed in vain, it's this idea that, you know, you may have come to Jesus hastily without actually even really understanding the gospel. So the gospel is very, very important, church, when it comes to knowing Jesus. Paul wants to talk about resurrection, 
not just as some idea. He, he wanted to under, the Corinthians to understand that resurrection is at the very heart of the gospel that we have to cling to as Jesus' people. So if the question were asked, what is the gospel, the first thing you should be seeing is that it has something to do with resurrection. It's really, really important. And the first question Paul wants to answer before we even get to resurrection is what is the gospel? If you're a Christian, man, like this really matters. If you're not a Christian, this really matters. What is the gospel? Now, the gospel can be expressed in all kinds of ways. You can zoom way out and you can take it from, you know, creation, fall, the story of Israel, you know, the the promise of a Savior before that, the story of Israel, the coming of Jesus. You can detail our future hope. That can be the gospel. When I was uh, like 18, 19 years old and doing a pastoral internship, my pastor one time asked me, what is the gospel? And I didn't have a great response. And so he said, okay, here's your homework for the week. Go home and, you know, figure out what, what is the gospel and write it down in your own words and memorize it. And be able to give me the gospel in 60 seconds or less. I could still recite that for you, which I won't do now, but it was just such a valuable gift. So the gospel can be delivered in this, these long form, like, you know, 60 seconds, an hour long presentation of kind of the whole story of God. Or the gospel, the gospel can be boiled all the way down to a few really simple lines. And that's what Paul gives us here in 1 Corinthians 15. The Holy Spirit through Paul gives us the gospel in four simple points. Here they are. The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. That Jesus was buried. That Jesus was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That Jesus appeared to Peter and then the twelve. So Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now Paul repeats according to the scriptures twice in his gospel presentation. And this is important because what it means, church, is that Jesus was not the inventor of some new religion. Jesus was not like the new, the, new, the new guru who had his own private experience with God and now was going to tell the world about it. No, Jesus was the fulfillment of the scriptures. He was the fulfillment of the promise of God. The gospel is according to the scriptures. And according to the scriptures, a savior, a messiah, someone to save us from the root cause of all of our brokenness would come for us. Someone was coming, sent from God to deal with our sin. Now sin, sin is not primarily about your behavior. So you may have grown up in an environment where sin was like, you know, smoking, drinking, I don't know what it was for you, but playing cards, going to the movie, I mean, fill in the blanks, whatever the behaviors that were forbidden were for you. But sin is not primarily about behavior. Sin is not even primarily about the breaking of some moral code. These things evidence sin, but that's not what sin is at its heart. What sin is, church, at its core is the attempt to put anyone or anything else in the place of God. That's what sin is. Anyone, including yourself, or anything in the place of God. To not worship God as he is, is sin. It is the missing of the mark. It is the thing, it is the root cause of our spiritual death, of the corruption, decay, evil, injustice of our world. It's our sin. Someone else put it this way. What is sin? The glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired. The power of God not praised. The truth of God not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed. The beauty of God not treasured. The goodness of God not savored. The faithfulness of God not trusted. The commandments of God not obeyed. The justice of God not respected. The wrath of God not feared. The grace of God not cherished. The presence of God not prized. The person of God not loved. Sin church is where we put any It's where we put anything or anyone in the place that rightfully and truly only belongs to God which means that we have all sinned By this definition we have all sinned We have all joined ourselves 
with the curse ruling creation right now. With death and decay. And the, the wages for that, like the penalty of that sin, it, it's very logical, it's very simple. If we reject life, we receive death. If we reject the one who is life in himself, the giver of life, we say we don't want him, then he says, okay. He gives us the ability to choose for ourselves what we want. We didn't choose him, and so we were handed over to the eternal life that we were built for, but without him. It's called death. Destruction. The root cause of all the corruption, evil, injustice, and brokenness in you, in me, between us, and between our creator, all of it, is this sin. And so Jesus came and died for our sin, according to the scriptures. Jesus' death was what the, is what the Bible calls a propitiation. It means wrath-bearing sacrifice. Jesus' death is what the Bible calls atonement. It means a cleansing, a covering, a putting away of sin. Jesus' death was a substitution. On the cross, Jesus became, church, he became our sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. This is the substitution that was made when Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. There is no gospel without this. What Jesus did by dying on the cross according to the scriptures was willingly absorb God's wrath for our sin, his justice. We love justice. Well, so does God. Jesus absorbed his wrath, his justice in our place. In love, God himself paid what we owed so we could receive what only Jesus deserved. He died on the cross. According, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then Jesus was buried. This point matters because Jesus was actually dead. There were traditions that sprung up immediately in the first century that, you know, after these rumors of resurrection that Jesus was never actually dead. No, Jesus was actually dead. His body was devoid of life. And Jesus' lifeless body was placed in a tomb. Jesus didn't just suffer, he suffered willingly. He gave up his life. And on the third day, Jesus was raised, again, according to the scriptures. There is no gospel, there is no good news without resurrection. Without resurrection, all Jesus did was die. But because Jesus was raised physically, we know that in his death he conquered Satan, sin, death, and demons. Jesus' resurrection, church, means that Jesus reigns. The resurrection means Jesus reigns. Now, don't miss these words in, 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 in that third point that Paul gives us. Don't miss these words, was raised. Jesus was raised from the dead. There was a power that reached into that tomb and poured through Jesus' lifeless body to raise him from the dead. There was a power. He was raised. He didn't raise himself. In the gospel, he said that he could raise himself, but the Bible tells us that Jesus did not raise himself. It tells us that there was a power that entered Jesus' lifeless body, and he was raised. He was passive in the raising. The raising was done to him. Jesus was raised. He was declared innocent in the moment of physical resurrection. He was declared undeserving of death. And all of this begs the question, if Jesus was raised, what power raised him? 
If Jesus was raised, who raised Jesus? The Bible tells us that it was the Holy Spirit who entered Jesus and raised him from the dead. And then Paul says this in Romans 8.11, If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. We need to get this connection. We have to see this connection. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And the Bible says that if you're in Jesus, the same spirit who raised him is the one dwelling in you who wants to give life to your mortal body. Church, not your immortal body, your mortal body, your temporary body. There is the power of resurrection living in every Christian. Every son and daughter of God has the power of the resurrection living within their mortal body. This is not just what is going to happen. This is where we live today. And and, and it means that Jesus' resurrection is an invitation for us to continually experience resurrection power. Jesus' resurrection which is at the heart of the gospel, is an invitation for us now to continually experience resurrection power. We're going to get to that in a second. We're going to come back to that. But look at this fourth one with me. So Jesus died for our sins. According to the scriptures, Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And then number four, Jesus appeared to Peter and the twelve. So his appearance is important, and his appearance matters because this was no um, like theophany, a theological word from the Old Testament to describe like these appearings of God, but not, in, not as a human. This was no theophany, this was no fantasy. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, a human being who was raised from the dead, conquering Satan's sin, death, and demons, actually walked the earth. Like, it's amazing to think of God incarnate at the birth, walking the earth through those 33 years of ministry and life. That's amazing. But you know what's even, like, equally amazing, maybe more so, is that after he was put to death and raised from the dead, he walked the earth again, the only and first fully, truly, holy human being to ever to ever walk the face of this earth. So Jesus appeared. He appeared in his glorified body to Peter, Cephas, and the twelve. This gospel, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, that he appeared, this gospel is not something that we are ashamed of as Jesus' people because this is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. And do you know why the gospel is so powerful? Do you know why this message we call the gospel, this good news, do you know why it's so powerful? It's so powerful, church, because Jesus is alive. If Jesus were dead, these ideas would have no power But these ideas actually have power. They are actually our reality, they, they speak to the reality of all things because Jesus is right now alive. Do you know that Jesus is right now aware of this gathering? This is not the only gathering of the church today or around the world, but Jesus is aware of this gathering. He is aware of what we are doing today. His spirit is here and present because Jesus is alive and he wants to do something with this. He wants to do something in you. He wants you to be changed. Whether you know him already or not yet, he wants you to be impacted, for you to experience the power of his resurrection. The biblical call, the biblical call, the invitation to Jesus is not a call to blind faith. What's being presented to us here in the gospel is a historical claim. This is a claim of an event that took place. This is why, by the way, I love books like um, uh, Jesus Outside the New Testament. And if you haven't seen that, you should go grab a copy of it. Like it's, it just shows you uh, historical writings about Jesus outside of the Bible. 
like how some of his contemporaries and some of the ancient historians were wrestling with this Galilean called Jesus who was turning the world upside down. This is a historical man, and the gospel is the claim of an historical event. And, it's why, and any claim of a historical event exposes, exposes itself necessarily to testing. Not blind faith, history. History. So that's why when Paul writes, so Jesus appeared... No theophany, no fantasy. Jesus appeared to Sisyphus, Peter, and then to the twelve. Then Paul writes, and he also appeared to 500 others at one time, some of whom are still alive. Like when Paul wrote these words, he was saying to the Corinthians, you can test this. There are witnesses to the resurrection still alive, still present. People who had their lives turned upside down who are still present and witnessing to the power of Jesus' resurrection. And and from the rest of our text, Paul's going to go in a little bit more detail to some of the people Jesus appeared to. From the rest of what he says here in the rest of our verses, I want to just just hang our hats on, on two really important implications of Jesus appearing. His appearing. This fourth part of the gospel here. The, the first implication that I want us to think about and, and, and hopefully be changed by is that the gospel, this good news, is meant to be experienced. It's meant to be experienced. Not just understood, it's meant to be experienced. It's meant to be carried in your body. It's meant to be carried in your life. It's meant to be carried into your family and into your workplace. It's meant to dictate how you live and what you do and what your plans are for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years if God's grace and gives them to you. After telling us that Jesus appeared to the twelve, Paul tells us that there were 500 others, and then he points us to James. He singles out James. And if you're reading through this, you should wonder, why is he singling out James? Well, the James being mentioned here is not James, the son of Zebedee, who we're introduced to in the, in the four gospel accounts. This is not that James. It's another James. The James being mentioned here by Paul is who, someone who was known as James of Jerusalem. And this was actually Jesus' own brother. Why is this significant? Well, Remember, Paul is talking about the appearing of Jesus. The testing of this historical claim. And so he points to one of the most profound witnesses there was of Jesus' resurrection. James of Jerusalem. Someone who in Galatians is, is called a pillar of the Jerusalem church. See, James, we see James, this James, in the Gospels at times, like with his mother, his brothers, and they're, they think Jesus is out of his mind. They think he's crazy. They think what he's doing is nuts. And then something happens, and later on, James becomes James of Jerusalem, a, a pillar of the Jerusalem church. Now, I don't know if you have brothers or not. I have a brother. And my brother actually even is a part of our church with his family. They're a part of this local church. Do you know what I could never get my brother to do? Worship me. I've tried. It's never worked. Do you know why he won't worship me? It's not because I'm not a great person. It's not because he doesn't love me. We have too much history. We're brothers. He's a great guy. But worship is not on the table for either one of us, any which direction. So what has to happen for you to begin to worship your brother as God? And in the case of James of Jerusalem, be martyred, murdered, stoned to death for worshiping your own brother. I'll tell you what has to happen. An encounter with resurrection power. An encounter with resurrection power. It is the only thing that could do that. What could take these disciples, who when Jesus was taken away and brought to the cross and murdered, they ran, scattered, 
hid. Even Cephas, Peter, the leader of the group, the, the most rough and tumble, like guy who runs into everything first. Jesus, he said to Jesus a few hours earlier, even if I have to die for you, I will never deny you. What takes Peter, and then he, he ends up denying Jesus three times that night. Now what takes this, this group of, of, of men and women following Jesus, hiding, scared, depressed, having lost everything, and turns them into the 12 apostles who will take the world by well, the 11 apostles plus, who will take the world by storm and most be killed for their faith. What has to happen? An encounter with resurrection power. And that's where Paul takes us next, actually, when he tells us his own story. Just before we get to Paul, it doesn't matter who you are. An encounter with resurrection power is what is on the table for you right now. It doesn't matter who you are. An encounter with resurrection power. The power of Jesus' resurrection. Please do not write this off as an exciting thing for brand new Christians. We are not invited to know Jesus the way we know of historical figures. We are invited to know Jesus the way we know living, breathing people. And it means that encounter with resurrection power is on the table for you in a fresh way. I don't care how long you've walked with Jesus. I don't care how dark your past is. I don't care how dark your week was. It's on the table for you now. We're going to get more to that in a second. But we, we, are, we are invited to receive the gospel, encounter resurrection power, and for our lives to never be the same. And it was Paul's story. Here's the second implication. I told you the first. The first was to experience the gospel. Well, the first was that the gospel is meant to, experience, to be experienced. The second is that to experience the gospel, grace, grace has to be tasted. Now, here's what I mean. After detailing the gospel, the good news... And the appearing of the resurrected Jesus to the 12, to the 500, and to James, Paul gives his own personal testimony of encounter. Look at verse 8. Last of all, he writes, As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He had that before Popeye, by the way. <laughs> by the grace of God, I am what I am. That really killed the moment. And his grace toward me was not in vain. In the realm of the apostles, Paul understood himself as the least. He used this language, untimely born. It, it speaks of an abnormal birth. Somebody in those days who would likely have been considered cursed, a freak of nature. He saw himself as the least of them because he didn't walk with Jesus like the others. He actually hated the church. He killed the Christians, Stephen among them, the first Christian martyr. He was giving his life to try and destroy the movement we call the church and then... Paul had his own encounter with resurrection power. Paul tasted grace and everything changed. After receiving grace, experiencing grace, Paul was hooked. He knew there was no greater power anywhere in the universe and he gave the rest of his life to deliver what he received. I delivered to you, he writes, what I also received. This is the nature of the Christian life. Church, we are messengers, nothing more. Whatever else you think you're doing in life, if you do not understand as Jesus, as an heir to Jesus' throne, as a child of God in this world, someone spiritually alive, if you don't understand your life calling as a messenger, you're missing it. Every Christian has received this gospel. And the call of every Christian is to deliver this gospel. This gospel that is according to the scriptures. That means a gospel that we are not invited to tweak or adapt or change. 
You might not like language of propitiation or atonement or substitution. It doesn't change the fact that this is the gospel we have received and we are called to deliver. And there is nothing else that we're doing here. This is what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. Jesus came and lived and died and rose to give us the gospel. And now our responsibility as we've received it is to deliver the gospel to others. But this is not meant to be born out of obligation or duty or responsibility even. It's something that's supposed to overflow from our own continual experiences with resurrection power. I love how Anthony Thistleton describes resurrection. He says, resurrection is all about God's sovereign power as sheer gift and grace. Grace that confers life upon the dead and transforms the lifeless. Look, there is a prerequisite for you to experience grace. I mean, even as a Christian, there is a prerequisite for you to continually walk in the experience of God's grace. You know what the prerequisite is? It's your own sin. Your own, there's no grace without our need of forgiveness. There's no grace without our need of mercy. And it's such a sad reality that so many people carry with them this idea that they are too far gone. That their life is too dark. That their body is too broken. That they have made too many mistakes. That they've hurt too many people. And now they carry with them this idea that they have to punish themselves. And maybe if they punish themselves enough, God will have mercy on them and forgive them. You have to know you are not living the gospel. The gospel is a different direction. You start at the same place. Your brokenness, your sin, all the people you've hurt, all the times you've rejected God. You start at the same place place, but instead of looking at your own punishing of yourself, you look to Jesus on the cross. And you realize that access has been made for you, and this sin you carry, this placing of other things, other people in the place of God, has been atoned for, covered, cleansed, put away from you. This is the power of the gospel. Our Lord did not come to call the strong and self-sufficient and self-made. He came for his enemies. He moves to strengthen the weak. He moves to heal the sick. He moves to make his home with those of broken spirits and contrite hearts. If you have a broken spirit today, you are perfectly positioned to experience resurrection power. The only people who cannot experience resurrection power are are those who understand themselves to be self-made, self-sufficient, to need nothing. To them, Jesus says, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. The hospital is not a place for clean people to come and gather together and celebrate how great they are. This place is supposed to be a hospital. And we have the medicine. And you have the medicine. You've received the cure and you are called to carry the vaccine with you everywhere you go and administer it to every broken person that you see who's ready and receptive to healing. So all we need now, in this moment, it's why we gather, all we need now is a movement of the Holy Spirit. We can't control that. It's not going to be one on Mark's guitar playing, or my pathetic attempt at preaching, we need the Holy Spirit, and he is sovereignly moves as he wills, and I've said it before, if he is speaking to you, if lights are going on, if you are seeing things in your life, it is him. 
It's him at work. We need a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit. We need him to come and touch lives and hearts. We need him to call sinners to receive cleansing. We need a river flowing through this place, washing us clean. Not just those who haven't yet known Jesus, but those who have too. You need to be refreshed in those same waters again, Christian. It's the only way you can deliver what you have received. It has to be an overflow. An overflow. So this is why we come to the bread and the wine. This is what this time is for. These are the elements that the Lord Jesus gave us on the night that he was betrayed. He said, remember me. He said, celebrate my death. And there is a spiritual power at work in these elements. In 1 Corinthians, we've studied it. Some of you are sick. Some of you have even died because you've partaken of these elements in an unworthy manner without examining yourself, hastily coming to Jesus, in vain worshiping Jesus. Do not do that. You are better, church, hear me, you are better off to not worship Jesus, to not take communion than to do it in vain, to do it hastily, to do it without applying yourself, to do it without examination to do it without letting him work on you, to do it without surrender, you are better off just to stay where you are. But for those ready, hungry, wanting an encounter with resurrection power himself, the power who raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, he says, yes. The promises of God are yes and amen. All you have to do is come to him in surrender. All you have to do is lay your life before him and again I am yours I belong to you you bow before Jesus Lord God and King and resurrection power fills you and so there will be people down here to pray for you we need help we need each other so come get prayed for there's power in that there's spiritual gifts in the room, different kinds of gifts. Some people can see. Some people have the discernment of spirits. Some people have words of wisdom and words of knowledge. Somebody might have a prophecy for somebody else. I invite you, like, ask the Lord. If you know you operate in certain gifts, ask the Lord to go to work right now. Look around the room. Pray for the people you see and begin ministering to each other. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to sing truths. But just before, and we're going to take communion. But just before we do, I want to invite you if you want a touch from the Holy Spirit today, you might not know Jesus yet, in which case, please come talk to us afterward. Come talk to people down here praying. But if you want a touch, if you want an experience with resurrection power, I can't give it to you, but I can, we can ask him together. I'm already standing because I want one. So if you want one, stand as well. We'll pray and we'll take communion. Holy Spirit, you know the hearts in this room. You know those who are standing because they are hungry for you. You know those who are standing because they just feel awkward. You know. You know the hungry hearts, Lord. You know the sickness in our souls and in our bodies. You know the spiritual strongholds. You know the chains that need to be broken. You know, Holy Spirit, we just ask, we ask for you to do what only you can do. Would you change lives in this moment? Would you redirect business plans in this moment? Would you redirect families in this moment? Would you redirect plans? Would you reinterpret our lives for us? As we walk out of this building after worshiping you again today, would you let us see differently? Would you open our eyes to the spiritual realm? Would you show us the people who need this gospel, this good news delivered to them? Lord, would you who has made us recipients also make us just faithful delivery people of this gospel? But Lord, would you do it from a place of our own enjoyment, our own continual experience with resurrection power? Lord, we know that you, Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, you want to give life 
to our mortal bodies so that we can live your will, your plan. So without any strength in ourselves, we just declare together, Lord, this will not be by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Make your people in this world, Lord, make us in this day and age such salt and light that the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms ruled by the powers and principalities of evil would no longer be the largest kingdoms in our mind, but that we would see the hope being prepared for us. In Jesus' name, amen.